Hi, welcome to our special webinar presentation today on Christianity's truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, Pascal's apologetic and the Imago Dei. Uh, thankful that you could join us here. I certainly would love to be able to, to have this seminar in person, but uh, thankful for the opportunity for us to still be able to, to have uh, time to hear from Dr. Threlfall, and hopefully it'll be a help to you as you uh, think about your ministry and perhaps uh, have an opportunity to, to benefit from this, even if you're not in our area. So glad to have you join us here today. We do have with us here uh, this afternoon, Dr. Jonathan Threlfall. Uh, Dr. Threlfall is the senior pastor of uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, where he and his wife, Krista, and their four children live. Uh, he also uh, holds a THM in biblical spirituality and, and a PhD in apologetics and worldview from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Threlfall has published two articles uh, related to the topic that he's addressing today, one in Philosophia Christi, the other in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. And so we're excited to have him come. He's going to do his first uh, presentation. We'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back and have a second presentation. And then at the end, we have an opportunity for you to submit some questions and uh, have some Q&A interaction. If you actually do want to submit a question, uh, do so as soon as you have the question. Uh, you can email it to at, uh, info at dbts.edu. Again, that's info at dbts.edu. We will be compiling those questions, and then we'll be presenting those to Dr. Threlfall at the end of the two uh, lectures this afternoon. Dr. Threlfall, please come. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to thank uh, the seminary so much for this opportunity to present this topic. I think it's very important. And I think it has great practical significance uh, for life and ministry. And uh, so again, the topic, we're talking about Blaise Pascal and his approach to apologetics and how that combines with a theme in biblical theology, and that is uh, the image of God, the theme of the Imago Dei. So very grateful to be here, looking forward to our, our time together. Let me just tell you what you can expect. Uh, so there are four main parts to the, the, two, the two talks that I'm going to have, the two, you know, the one o'clock and then a two o'clock. And uh, I'm going to go through four main parts. Uh, here's what I want you to take away uh, with, with you is, first of all, I want you to be able to grasp a powerful and versatile approach to Christian persuasion, uh, which you probably haven't encountered before. And that is Pascal's anthropological approach to Christian persuasion. I'll explain what that, that means in just a moment. Uh, and and the, the, the second uh, main takeaway is that you'll have seen how this approach is substantiated biblically uh, from a biblical theological theme, the biblical theological theme of the Imago Dei. Uh, and then third, uh, so that you, in combination, as we see how Pascal's apologetic, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment, and this biblical theological theme of the Imago Dei, how they combine to form a very powerful apologetic, uh, a, a, a even more powerful, I think, than many of the approaches to apologetics that we're often uh, familiar with today. And then finally, I'm going to give you some practical ways that you can apply this in life and ministry. It's going to have a tremendous application uh, for in your own sanctification, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, if you're in Christian leadership, if you're a pastor of a ministry, if you speak uh, to people on a regular basis from the Bible, if you seek to appeal to people to believe in Jesus Christ or to believe more deeply in Jesus Christ, this, this, these concepts have application. Uh, and another th uh, these are, So these are the four parts that you'll have grasp a, a powerful and versatile approach to Christian persuasion, uh, understand how that approach is substantiated from a biblical theological theme, see how it provides a more robust approach to Christian persuasion, and then see some practical applications of this. I think that this is a very neglected theme. Few people understand really what Blaise Pascal was doing in his apologetic, primarily because we often hear, when we hear apologetics and Blaise Pascal, if you know, if you know much about apologetics and you've heard about Blaise Pascal, typically what you think of is his wager argument. And that's where he says, all things considered, you're better off believing in God, believing in Jesus, than if you didn't, because the stakes are so high. You might as well just, just say, hey, if the worst thing that could happen to me is I'll have been wrong in this life. But if I don't believe in, in God, then the worst thing that will happen to me is I'll go to hell. So all things considered, just believe in God. That's, that's the, the wager argument. 
And, and really that played a very small role in Pascal's overall effort to commend the Christian faith. So when you think of Blaise Pascal, he was a, the 17th century apologist, mathematician, scientist, with respect to apologetics, don't just think of the wager. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment really what his main contribution was to apologetics. Now before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit my, about my story, about how I got into this topic. So I was working on my on my PhD, and I was getting to the dissertation stage, and I was talking with my brother-in-law, and my brother-in-law had gone through this process. He had written a dissertation, and he said, Jonathan, when you get to the dissertation phase of your, of your PhD work, you don't want to write on a topic that's going to make you feel nauseated when you, whenever you think about it. Uh, you want to write on a topic that you are actually excited about. Uh, I think he gave the example. He said, you don't want to go and study, do an analysis of the, the minutes of the Kentucky Baptist churches uh, from a certain period of time in the 1800s and, and analyze that. that. That might get boring after a while. You want to do something that's really meaningful. And so I prayed a lot about this. And I asked the Lord to give me wisdom uh, to help me understand what I should write on. And I knew that what I needed to write on, because my concentration was apologetics and worldviews, it had to have something to do with apologetics. Uh, and so that was a given. It had to be an apologetic in nature. But I also wanted to write on something that was able to connect apologetics with biblical theology. And, and by biblical theology, I mean the, the theologies, the teachings about God and other topics that, are, that emerged throughout the flow of, of, the, of the Scripture. And uh, I had grown to love biblical theology in my studies. And I knew that whatever I wanted to do, write on, I wanted to write on uh, biblical theology as well. And another thing that I wanted for my dissertation is I wanted it to be Christ-centered because uh, Jesus Christ is the most important person in my life. And how to bring all these things together in an academically acceptable, and academically excellent dissertation was the problem that I was, I was faced with. I read a paragraph in the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology that helped me with this question. I'm going to read this to you. This is from Peter Adams' article called Preaching and Biblical Theology. And listen to what he says about the connection between biblical theology and apologetics. He says this, It is not possible to, quote, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, end quote, without teaching a biblical worldview, and we cannot do this without biblical theology. We cannot help people to address the pervasive worldviews of humanism, postmodernity, secularism, materialism, and pantheism by providing them with a few helpful texts or pious ideas. They must begin to, quote, think God's thoughts after him. And they do this by learning the shape of God's self-revelation in history and in the Bible. This biblical theology is the best corrective for false worldviews, just as it is the best corrective for destructive heresy. By teaching and using biblical theology in all or Bible teaching, we point people to the objective and historical reality of God's progressive and purposeful revelation. Throughout this revelation, God speaks a transcendent message to people in every age and shapes their minds, hearts, and lives so that they can know and serve him and speak his truth to others. That paragraph grabbed me because I realized that biblical theology, rightly taught, rightly preached, and rightly understood, could be the most powerful apologetic. Why? Because it helps us to think God's thoughts after him. It helps us to interpret the world that we live in, helps us to understand who we ourselves are. Now, the, my question then was, because I'm telling you the story of how I got to my dissertation topic, my question then was, how am I going to bring biblical theology and apologetics to bear? Well, I started reading Blaise Pascal's writings, the Pensée, and that, that's simply French for thoughts. Pensée were a collection of writings, fragments that Pascal had, had written down over the course of his life, which he intended to be a complete work of apologetics defending the Christian faith. He never ended up finishing it. There are a lot of reasons why he didn't do so. Uh, some people say that he didn't finish it because he realized that there was a contradiction in his, in his worldview. Some people thought that he didn't finish it because 
Uh, he realized that his Augustinian view of grace conflicted with uh, some other things that he believed. All those are just speculations. The most obvious reason to me why he didn't finish was that he died when he was young. He was 39 years old. He was not able to complete it because uh, he died as a younger man. And yet these, these writings that, that we now call the Pensee, uh, these fragments, fragmentary, it's not like one satisfactory complete book, uh, yet they contain some very powerful arguments for the Christian faith. And as I read, as I read these, these writings by Blaise Pascal, I suddenly felt myself almost being searched for oh, my own pride and hypocrisy. Um, Pascal had a way of just digging right down into my own heart and helping me understand that I was this paradoxical duality of greatness and wretchedness. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So I decided that I wanted to write on Blaise Pascal as the apologetic side of my dissertation. And, uh, and then I realized that I wanted to bring the work of Blaise Pascal together with the doctrine of the Imago Dei, a biblical theological theme, and to see how those would interface. And so just by way, that's the story of how I got to my dissertation. And the, the, the central idea is that the doctrine of the Imago Dei, that is a biblical theological theme, reinforces what Pascal is saying that is true about human beings as it serves this apologetic, uh, his apologetic project. So, we're going to get into that. First of all, what did Pascal think about apologetics, about the arguments for the Christian faith? Well, uh, Pascal was skeptical about the usefulness of some of the most common arguments for Christianity. For example, he said this, the metaphysical proofs for the existence of God, and these are proofs uh, like uh, the the proof from an unmoved mover, everything we see around us and moving somehow. And so how did everything get started moving? Well, there had to be a first first mover that wasn't himself moved. That mover must be God. Pascal says, I don't think that those are going to be really helpful in convincing people to believe in God. He says this, the metaphysical proofs for the existence of God are so remote from human reasoning and so involved that they make little impact. And even if they did help some people, it would only be for the moment during which they watched the demonstration because an hour later they would be afraid that they had made a mistake. He said these are useful only insofar as someone's able to follow the line of reasoning. And yet when they forget exactly how those thoughts were connected, then they're going to think, oh no, was it it real? And then he said this. He said, the most important proofs for Christianity are the proofs that speak directly to the heart. And he writes this, and you may have heard this quote before. For the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. Okay, the question is then, how does a person speak directly to the human heart? Here is Pascal's answer. By speaking to the heart's deepest cry, its deepest longing, its deepest craving, and that is, to explain to a human being why he or she finds himself in such a paradoxical mix of greatness and wretchedness. And so this brings us then to Pascal's overall case for Christianity. Pascal would have broken down, had he finished his apologetic project, would have broken it down into these three parts. First of all, he would have shown that Christianity is not unreasonable. It's not illogical. There's nothing irrational or subpar about believing in the truth claims of Christianity. The second part would have been to put his readers into such a frame of mind that they wanted Christianity be, to be true. So he would first, he'd first of all say this, Christianity is not repugnant to reason. You're not committing some sort of intellectual mistake by believing in Christianity. And second, he's going to make you wish it were true. And then third, he's going to demonstrate that it really is true, okay? So those three, you see the three movements in his apologetic project say that it's not unreasonable, make them wish that it were true, and then prove that it is so. Now, it's that second part that Pascal really focused on, making people wish that Christianity was true. How how in the world would you make anybody wish that Christianity was true? Well, here's Pascal's technique. The way to make people wish that Christianity is true is to show them something about themselves that they cannot explain through any other worldview. And this is the genius of 
Pascal's argument. And this is why we call it an anthropological argument, because it begins with the human being, anthropos, man. It begins with, with who we are. And this is an incredibly accessible and close argument. Like, we know what we feel. We know what we think. We know what we experience. This is why it's so powerful. He starts with, with the experiences that we know, with the feelings that we have, and he says, here's how you can make someone wish Christianity were true. Show them something about themselves that they already know to be true, but yet they cannot explain, and make them beg for an explanation. Prove to them that no other perspective in life, prove to them that no other religion or worldview can satisfactorily explain these paradoxes that they feel to be true within themselves and then show that Christianity provides that explanation and then indeed it is true. So that's what, you see that's what he's doing. He said, show that it's not unreasonable, make them wish it were true, and then prove that it is true. In the Pensee, uh, Pascal himself says, I quote this, Men despise religion, and by religion he's referring to the Christian religion. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. The cure for this is first to show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, make it attractive. Make good men wish it were true, and then show that it is. Show them that it is worthy of reverence, because it really understands human nature. So, how in the world is he going to make people wish that Christianity were true? How is he going to show people that they have within themselves some contradictions that only Christianity can solve? Well, let me, I will walk you through how he did this in, in three parts, okay? How is Pascal going to demonstrate to people that they have something in themselves that can be explained only by the Christian faith? Well, he points out these tensions within ourselves that we feel and that we know and let me, let me explain them in these ways. There's a psychological tension, an epistemological tension, and an existential tension, all right? So there's a psychological te- uh, uh, tension, and we can simplify and say, and say this. I feel both happy and miserable, all right? The epistemological tension is that I feel both certain and uncertain, and the existential tension is I feel both significant and insignificant, okay? And I'll walk through those one at a time. So first of all, there's a psychological tension, And that is that we have a longing for happiness, but misery is perhaps one of the most uh, well-known and obvious features of human existence. So he explains it this way, and I'll quote. He says this, All men seek happiness. There are no exceptions, indicating that we have some awareness of happiness. So the very fact that you are unhappy shows that you have some idea about what happiness is. Pascal speaks of inanimate objects. He says a tree isn't as miserable as a human being. Yet a tree doesn't have as many luxuries as a human being. Why? A tree doesn't have the craving that a human being does. We have this craving for happiness demonstrating that we must have some idea of what it means to be happy. And and how does he then go on to uh, demonstrate this from, uh, from the way he observes People. Well, Pascal lived, as I said earlier, in 17th century uh, Paris. And in Paris at the time, the people, the circles that Pascal ran in, had this obsession with entertainment. Does that sound like American culture? Yes, very much so. Lots of parallels between Pascal's 17th century Paris and our 21st century America. And the word that he used in the English translations of uh, the pensée is divertissement. It's this word meaning uh, a diversion, uh, a distraction, recreation, uh, entertainment. And he, he, um, what he's doing here, he's, he's using this theme of divertissement, this, this theme of diversion, entertainment, distraction, to prove that human beings are, are horribly miserable. Uh, he does it in a variety of ways. He says that this craving for distraction or entertainment Uh, tells us that there is a secret instinct driving us to seek for happiness. And he observed this at play in, uh, in many areas. For instance, competitive sports, hunting, card games, sexual adventures, war, seeking government office, gambling, the theater. And Pascal is saying, what's the, what is, the, the problem is not so much that these pursuits are necessarily in and of themselves wrong. It is that in pursuing these things, human beings realize that they're after something they could never attain. Why? 
Take a hunting trip, for example. As soon as they catch the rabbit, they're off to the next hunting trip. What they're really chasing is not the rabbit, but it's something that they can never actually grasp. They're chasing for happiness, and they can never find it. He talks about tennis. He says these grown men are chasing a ball around this tennis court, and yet they're never satisfied uh, when they play well because then they want to play even better. Uh, He talks about gambling. He says if you promise to give somebody the amount of money that they would earn in one day of gambling, uh, and if they instead wouldn't gamble, say, I'll just give you the money in advance. Just promise you won't gamble. He says, they're not going to do that. Why? Because the fun is in the thrill. The fun is in the pursuit. It's not in the thing that's pursued. Uh, he says this, that is why gaming and feminine society, war and high office are so popular. It's not that they really bring happiness, nor that anyone imagines that true bliss comes from possessing the money to be won at gaming or the hair that is hunted. No one would take it as a gift. What people want is not the easy, peaceful life that allows us to think of our unhappy condition, nor the dangers of war, nor the burdens of office, but the agitation that takes our mind off of it and diverts us. That is why we prefer the hunt to the capture. Now, this is a scathing uh, expose of the human psyche. Why are we so obsessed with recreation? Why are we so obsessed with entertainment? If it tells us anything, it tells us this. We can't find happiness in ourselves because we're always seeking it in something else. If there was happiness to be found in ourselves, we wouldn't be looking for it in this recreation. So he is explaining that there is a psychological tension between happiness and misery. He contrasts that with, uh, with this concept of ennui. It's a French word uh, meaning Uh, boredom or listless listlessness he says one of the worst things you could do to somebody is put them in a room all by themselves with nothing to do because then they'll have nothing else to think about but their own misery so what's just to uh, help you see the context here what i'm saying is this pascal is making people wish christianity were true and he's doing it by drawing out these tensions that are inherent in the human condition one of which is this psychological tension between happiness and unhappiness, uh, between greatness and wretchedness, okay? There's another area in which he points out this tension, and that is in uh, this area of epistemology, what we can know, okay? So not only is there the tension between happiness and unhappiness, the psychological tension that he points out here to prove that we, we need this explanation for our condition, but also in this area of certainty and uncertainty. He says this, man has within him the capacity for knowing truth, but he possesses no truth which is either abiding or satisfactory. He says, we have this idea that there must be truth to be known, but we, for some reason, we can't seem to be able to find that truth. He writes this, what a figment of the imagination human beings are. What a novelty, what monsters, chaotic, contradictory, prodigious, judging everything, mindless worm of the earth, storehouse of truth, cesspool of uncertainty and error. Okay, so we've looked at the the psychological and the epistemic, and now I'm trying to move here quickly because I want to get on to what he provides as the explanation, now the existential tension. So again, what he's doing is he's demonstrating that people, he's trying to get people to want Christianity were tr- are, is true, and he does so by pointing out these tensions that we feel to be true within ourselves. This existential tension is this tension between significance and insignificance. And here's where Pascal points out the fact that we find ourselves to be very, very small in the cosmos and also very, very large. Um, he, he, he zooms out and sees us in relation to uh, the universe as a whole and says how tiny, how insignificant we are. Listen to these words. Pascal writes this, When I consider the brief span of my life absorbed into the eternity which comes before and after the small space I occupy and which I see swallowed up in the infinite immensity of spaces of which I know nothing and which know nothing of me, I take fright and am amazed to see myself here rather than there. There is no reason for me to be here rather than there, now rather than then. Who put me here? By whose command and act were this time and place allotted to me? We find ourselves feeling incredibly insignificant. And yet, even though we feel ourselves to be so insignificant, he says it's the very thought of our insignificance that proves our greatness. 
I think the very fa- the fact that I can think about the universe, even though I can feel the universe swallowing me up in its greatness, yet by my mind, I could somehow wrap my mind around the fact that it is actually happening. So you see there's this tension between, why, why, let's go back to the first tension. Why do we feel this tension between happiness and unhappiness? Going back to the second one, the epistemic tension. Why do we feel this tension between certainty and uncertainty? The existential tension. Why do we feel this tension between significance and insignificance? Th- these, these create in us such this, a craving for explanation. Why am I so, so weird? <laughs> That's essentially what the Ponces are seeking, the Ponce is seeking to answer. Why do human beings exhibit such uh, a paradoxical duality? And that is, Pascal says, because we were created by God and for God, but we have fallen into sin. So in the course of Pascal's apologetic, he is trying to get his readers, again, to identify within themselves such tensions that can be explained no other way except through Christian anthropology. The explanation for this paradoxical duality is this. We were created by God, but have fallen into sin. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go through those, the psychological, epistemic, and existential to see how Christian anthropology, according to Pascal, solves this. If true happiness were to be found in finite things, your happiness were to be found in the, the, uh, the hunt, in the political office, in the sexual liaison. If true happiness were to be found in these things, then humans would surely have discovered it a long time ago. However, they have not discovered it. Therefore, happiness cannot be found in finite things. And therefore, God, the only being of infinite, infinite worth, is the only source of true happiness. He writes this, our soul happiness is in him and our soul evil is in separation from him. So what he's done is this. He's made his readers, his audience, crave to know an explanation as to why we feel this tension between unhappiness and happiness and saying, well, here's the answer. It's because you were created for God, but you've fallen into sin. You're seeking happiness in things that aren't God. That's why you feel this tension. That's why you feel so incredibly happy. That's why, ironically and paradoxically, you feel un- even more unhappy in your pursuit of the things that you think will bring happiness. I mean, what, else, what other explanation can you offer except that you're not meant to be satisfied by finite things, but only infinite things? You see how this argument is so close to the human heart? You see how this argument is so accessible? We feel that all the time. We experience that all the time. This argument hasn't aged over the hundreds of years since Pascal first uh, articulated. Actually, it wasn't original with him. We find this argument going back as far as Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11. He has put eternity in the heart of man. Augustine said the same thing in the opening of his, of his confessions. He says, my heart, the heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. So what Pascal is doing is just carrying along this rich tradition, going all the way back to the Bible, that the human heart is only satisfied with something infinite. And that, that's what explains our, our mad, irrational running after things to try to fill this void that only God can fill. So he's brought his hearers to this, to this point where they, they demand an explanation and the explanation, the only explanation that suffices is that we're created by God and for God because true happiness is found only in God. Now, what about the epistemic tension that we talked about? Remember the epistemic tension is that tension that we have some idea of certainty, of truth, and yet we never can seem to find it. Well, he says, Pascal's explanation for that also is found in Christian anthropology. It is because we once had a grasp of truth because we were really willing to recognize who God was, but now because we've fallen into sin, we as sinners cannot accept the fact that God is a righteous God, and therefore we come with all kinds of narratives about reality that conflict with the reality that we experience, and therein lies the explanation for the fact that we have some sense that there is certainty to be had truth to be known, but we can't seem to get to it. So the explanation for the tension between certainty and uncertainty, that epistemic tension, is again found in Christian anthropology. All right, what about that third tension, the existential tension? That was the one where we feel this tension between we're really insignificant and given in light the, the, the massiveness of the cosmos, and yet we have some significance because with our mind and rationality, we can grasp it. Pascal says again, Where's the explanation? You're not going to find it in any other worldview, only the Christian faith, Christian anthropology. He says, be, he says humans, they need to realize that they're something, but they're not everything. Human beings want to believe that they're everything or that they're nothing. 
You see the polarities between an overweening ego and absolute despair. They both stem from pride. What Pascal is saying, well, human beings, when you understand we're something, God has made us something, but we're not everything like we like to think we are. He writes this. Well, that's actually a direct quote. We are something and we are not everything. Man must not be allowed to believe that he is either equal to animals or to angels, nor to be unaware of either, but he must know both. He writes, man's dignity consisted in his innocence in making use of creatures and being their master. And yet, in a fallen world, we have lost our proper orientation with respect to God, and that explains all that tension between our feeling of significance and insignificance. Our sin, Pascal would say, has twisted that what God intends to be our sense of proper orientation under his lordship, and we've tried to create our, become our own masters, and that's what explains this paradox of significance and insignificance, that tension uh, existentially. So, Pascal has brought his readers, his audience, to the point where they would wish that some explanation would provide the key to these tensions that they feel within themselves. And now Pascal's third move is to prove that the Christian faith that explains these tensions is, in fact, true. Now, I'm not going to deal with that part of Pascal's apologetic at all. Remember I said the three parts, going back uh, a little bit, the three parts of his, the phases of his apologetic approach was to, first of all, show that Christianity is not unreasonable, to make people wish it were true, and then to prove it was true. But in, in the pensée, Pascal spends uh, less time actually proving that it is true. He spends a lot of time proving to, to his readers that they are this tension, uh, this, this, this duality between greatness and wretchedness. Okay, so now you have a grasp, I hope, I hope, that you have a grasp of what Pascal was trying to do, how he was trying to win his readers over to the Christian faith. Now, how do we categorize this approach to apologetics? Well, I've referred to it as an anthropological argument. But if you've studied logic and reasoning, you might ask this. Well, in what sense is it an argument? Uh, because you may know that there are different kinds of arguments. There's, there's a deductive argument. There is uh, or deductive reasoning. There's inductive uh, reasoning. But there's also something called abductive reasoning. And uh, Pascal's anthropological approach to Christian persuasion falls into the category of abductive reasoning. Let me explain to you uh, why I say that and what that means. Abductive reasoning is a kind of reasoning that reasons to the best explanation given a set of data. So it would be like this. Let's say I come home from work one day and I see that the window is in, in my front, the front of my house is broken my boys are nowhere to be seen. There is a baseball bat lying in the yard. I walk inside the house and there is a baseball lying amid broken glass. And I'm looking at this scenario and I'm trying to figure out what happened. Now, I could come up with a variety of explanations. I could say possibly my wife had a baseball bat and from the outside of the window, she smashed the window with the baseball bat and my boys came from downstairs, put the ball amid the glass, and they all went upstairs and hid. Okay, that, that actually accounts for the data. And yet, it is, not, it is not the explanation that best satisfies the data. Why? Because my wife has never uh, broken a window with a baseball before, at least not that I know of. But my boys, however, are more likely to have put a baseball through the window. Just hypothetically, of course. Now, what the, given the data, abductive reasoning comes up with the best explanation for that data. What Pascal is doing, he's taking the data of human greatness and wretchedness. He's taking the data of the epistemic tension of the fact that we have this craving for certainty and truth, but that we seem not to be able to arrive at it. He's taking the data of the fact that people seem to be, through their entertainment, uh, their craving for entertainment, seem to be pursuing happiness but never able to achieve it. Through their sense of significance and insignificance in the cosmos, cosmos, they feel themselves to be great and yet incredibly insignificant. Okay, look at all that data. Now, abductive reasoning says, I think this explanation 
best meets the data point by point. Now, this is the kind of reasoning that we use most often. Um, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. I love to read Sherlock Holmes. Sometimes uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, would say that uh, Holmes is reasoning deductively. He says it's just deductive logic. Actually, most often, the kind of logic, the kind of reasoning that Holmes uses in those stories is not deductive, but abductive reasoning. He's taking the data, he's looking at it, and he's thinking, what's the best explanation given this, this data? Uh, one thing that's powerful about abductive reasoning is that it allows you to then predict something that might match that explanation. So, uh, for example, in one, of the, uh, in one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, this is from the Red-Headed League, Sherlock Holmes, Holmes suspects that his client's employee has been digging a tunnel to rob the London bank. And so Holmes and Watson, they want to, Holmes wants to see this employee, wants to see what he looks like. And when he, they open, they knock on the door of, of the office there and the employee comes to the door. And Holmes, instead of asking him about what he's been doing, merely asks him for directions. He says, hey, can you tell me how to get to such and such a place? And the employee says, yes, you take your turn, make this turn. And Holmes says, thank you very much. Then after they walk down the street, Watson asks Holmes, I said, I take it you just wanted to get a look at him. And he said, Holmes says, you're right. And uh, Watson says, did you want to get a look at his face? Holmes says, no, I was trying to look at his pants. And what Holmes was looking for was to see if his trousers, the employee's trousers, were muddy because if he had been digging a tunnel under the bank, he would have the evidence on, his, on the knees of his trousers. Hol uh, at the end of this, this, uh, this dialogue, Watson says, well, Holmes, what did you see? And Holmes says this, and this is important for abductive reasoning, what I expected to see. See, in light of this explanation, an explanation of abductive reasoning, if true, will allow us then to look for other clues that will corroborate that or disconfirm that explanation. Now, this is what brings us then to the doctrine of the image of God. Because if Pascal is right about anthropology, if he's right that human beings are this paradoxical duality of greatness and wretchedness exhibited in their craving for happiness and inability to find it, if he's right about this, then we should be able to find this substantiated in the Bible, right? If, if Pascal's Christian anthropology is really Christian anthropology, then we should be able to go to the Bible and find out whether or not it is true. Because as I was reading Pascal, I'm thinking, man, this is good stuff. I, I think that this resonates with me. I think it resonates with what I see about people. And yet, how do I know that this is actually biblical? Because if this is not substantiated biblically, then Pascal is wrong. And if he's wrong, then we could just throw the whole thing away. Okay, just wasted, and wasted 30 minutes of your time listening to all that explanation if Pascal was wrong about this anthropology. But if he's right, if his explanation of the human condition is confirmed by the biblical data, it could provide an even more compelling explanation for the human existence that is rooted in Christian theology. And this is what I'm getting at here now. If Pascal is right, we'll be able to go to the Bible and see Yes, that's what the Bible does teach about human beings. If Pascal is right, then we'll be able to go to the most important statement about what a human being is, and that is the statements that have to do with humans being created in the image of God, and that would confirm what Pascal is saying. If it doesn't, we just need to throw away that whole approach and find a different one. All right, so what I wanted to know and what I think we should be curious to know is, is what Pascal is saying about the human condition is it corroborated biblically? And this takes us to part two. Okay, so part one, I wanted you to understand this, the Pascal's approach to Christian persuasion. It's an approach I think that many people fail to understand because most people conflate it with 
uh, Pascal's wager, and they think that was his major contribution to apologetics, when in fact, Pascal was really what he was doing is focusing on the human condition and helping his readers understand that their condition is such that can be explained only through Christian theology. And now we're moving on to part two. We're asking the question, how does this connect with the biblical theological theme of the Imago Dei? And to do that, what I want to do is explain to you what is meant by the fact, the teaching, that human beings were created in the image of God. And to do that, I will take my Bible and we will go to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now, this is a very well-known passage uh, in which pe- people call it the divine deliberation. God is deciding to create human beings and explaining how he will do so. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That, that is the most important passage on the teaching that human beings were created in the image of God. So I'm going to give you five statements about what it means that humans were created in the image of God And this will fill out our understanding of the Bible's teaching about the Imago Dei so that then we can go back and see, does this confirm or disconfirm what Pascal is saying about the human condition? Does it corroborate or does it weaken his case? Does it make us think, wow, that is a powerful apologetic tool or no, he didn't get it quite right. We're going to have to move on to something else. So we're going to see if the features of the teaching about the doctrine of the Imago Dei, if they map onto Pascal's anthropology as an explanation for the human condition. Does, and just state it differently, does the teaching of the Imago Dei, does it help explain the tensions that we feel within ourselves? Okay, so let me go through these five statements about what it means that we're created in the image of God. I may get through part of these before we'll take our break. But first of all, to be created in the image of God means that human beings are fundamentally relational. It means that human beings are fundamentally relational. Uh, This is very clear from the wording, simply the fact that human beings are made in God's image means that who we are cannot be understood unless it's understood in relation to something else. So what a human being is, is unintelligible. What we are as human beings is unintelligible apart from our relationship to something else. Fundamentally, ontologically, core to our our identity as human beings is a relationship. And the relationship, first of all, is with God. So man is made in the image of of God. Now, what does it mean then for, for us to be fundamentally related to God? We find a little further light shed on this in Genesis chapter 5. There are two terms, they're synonyms, uh, uh, the Hebrew synonyms Tselem and Demuth, the, uh, the means image and likeness. Uh, we find those same words, the same terms in Genesis 5 verse uh, 3. Uh, now I'll, I'll catch this up to, from verse 1. Uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Now listen to this, the same words, Tselem and Demuth, image and likeness that were used in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 are now used in, in Genesis 5, 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So the, the, the same terms that describe the relationship between Adam and his son, the same terms that describe the relationship between father and son, also describe the relationship between God and humanity. So there is a very strong connection between bearing the image of God and being a descendant of God, being offspring of God, being a son of God. In fact, the word sonship 
is a good way of summarizing or, or uh, explaining what this concept of being created in, in the image of God really means. So the relationship that we are constituted for ontologically, fundamentally to our nature, is first of all a relationship with God that can be described as a father-son relationship. We see that confirmed then in Genesis 5.3. Now, the relationship is not only a vertical relationship between God and hu- human beings, but there's another component to this relationship. So we're fundamentally constituted for a relationship between, uh, with, with God, but there is, an, there is a horizontal aspect to this. Go back to Genesis 1.26, and you notice that it says, On the heels of God, the divine deliberation, let us make man in our image after our likeness. There, in the, the e, I'm reading from the ESV. There's a sentence break there, and then it goes on and says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. But scholars of the Hebrew language have, note, have noted that this verb, and let them have dominion, carries a, a purpose function from going back to God's deliberation to let us make, so that we can read this almost as follows. Let us make man in our image after our likeness so that they may have dominion. So our having been created in the image of God, fundamentally related to God in a relationship that can be described as, as sonship, has as its purpose or as its result a secondary relationship between human beings and the rest of the created order. So I, I'm, I'm saying that what it means to be created in the image of God means to be fundamentally constituted for a relationship, and that relationship is both vertical with God, but it is also horizontal. Now, the horizontal relationship, I said the, the vertical relationship between God and man is best described by the word sonship, The horizontal relationship can best be encapsulated by the word dominion. Toward God, we are to be submitted as sons. That's what human beings are meant to do. We're to be aligned in a relationship with God as a son would with his father. We're to represent, there's an idea of representation there as well, representing God as a son would bear likeness to and thus represent his father. And yet, as it, as it relates to the, the rest of the universe, we're supposed to have dominion. Now, the purpose of this, these two, this, this two-directional relationship between God and humans, and humans and the rest of the uh, re- created order, is best encapsulated by the word represent. So, we bear God's image so that we can represent God to the rest of the created order, and we do that by exercising dominion. So that first point then is this. What it means to be created in the image of God is that we are fundamentally relational. And then underneath that, that relationship goes two directions, toward God, toward the rest of the creation. Sonship, dominion, encapsulated by the word represent. Represent. Here is the second statement I'll make about what, is, what it means to be created in the image of God uh, or, or the, the filling out or understanding of the image of God. And that is this, sin perverts expressions of our bearing God's image. Sin perverts expressions of our bearing God's image. So, I said that what it means to bear the image of God means to have a relationship with God that's described as sonship and have a relationship with Uh, the rest of the universe that is best described by dominion. But what we see happening because of sin, we see these relationships being distorted. Think about what happened when the serpent tempted Eve. As an image bearer, Eve's responsibility was to represent God to the serpent as part of the creation by exercising dominion over the serpent. That was what Eve was supposed to do. That's what Adam was supposed to do. Adam and Eve were supposed to exercise dominion over the serpent by representing God to that serpent. But think about what happened instead. They allowed the serpent to misrepresent God to them, thus worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Here is a perversion of the God-intended purpose 
of humans bearing his image. Rather than representing God to the creature, they're allowing the creature to represent God, or more accurately, misrepresent God to them, and thus they are defying that sonship relationship that they ought to, ought to bear. That's, that's why Paul, in Romans chapter 1, is, is saying that instead of worshiping and serving the Creator, they've, they've switched it, they've flipped it, they've perverted it, and now the created things get worshipped, and the creature doesn't get worshipped. So sin perverts expressions of our bearing the image of God. Um, we, we see this also, evidence also of this in the New Testament, when in the epistles, Colossians and Ephesians, and also there's, there's some passages in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, we'll, we'll get to that later, that talk about the need for a renewed image of God. So while the scripture doesn't expressly say that the image of God has been distorted, it does imply that the need exists, otherwise there would be no need for the image to be restored in human beings. Now, we have to be very careful with our terminology here because some, in fact, many, many scholars on this whole topic of the image of God, many reputable scholars have put it in, in these words. They've said the image of God is erased or the image of God is defaced. Uh, Calvin puts it this way, the image of God is vitiated or the image of God is marred. They use these terminologies. The danger of the, the reason I've, I've used the term very carefully, I've used the term perverted because I want to make it clear that there is no diminishing of the image of God in any human being whatsoever. Every human is, is an image bearer of God. There, there are no degrees of image bearing. Every human being, no matter how sinful, is as much an image bearer as any, any other human being, no matter how righteous you say how in the world can that be especially Mar martin luther himself defined the image of god as original righteousness and yet we find it very clear that in later parts of uh, post fall genesis 9 6 what were the what was the reason given for capital punishment the reason for capital punishment was because human beings are created in the image of god the image of god language is repeated before or after the fall after the fall, what does that teach us? The, that, that sin did not remove the, the image of God in human beings. We find another occurrence of the reference to the image of God in the epistle of James. James talks about the dangers of gossip and tearing each other down. And he says, you, you, don't, you shouldn't talk about people like that. You shouldn't slander people like that. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. Is that before or after the fall? It's after the fall. So what we have to understand it very clearly is that Bearing God's image, all humans bear God's image, no matter how sinful. The reason why it's important to understand that is because if there are varying degrees of bearing the image of God, that means some people are less human than others. That means some people we might treat less as less of a human than others because, well, other, they don't exhibit the image of God as fully as these people. May, oh, those people are better image bear, bear, bearers. Oh, those people that really bear the image of God. So they should be treated. In a, in a, no, every human, th this is the foundation of human dignity. This is the foundation of human worth. This is, this is foundational to many of our convictions, even as, as a Western civilization, that in each, there is inherent worth in each human being. Where do we get that? The image of God. The image of God is universal to every human being. It's not removed, vitiated, defaced, erased, uh, marred in any way. And yet, what has sin done? It takes those expressions of imagedness and it perverts them for self-serving ends. The best illustration that I have of this is of the prodigal son. This actually, we, we, we read of, the, uh, of this in uh, a, a book by Emil Brunner. He, he's talking about, or Emil Brunner, he's talking about uh, the, the image of God. He uses this as an illustration. So the prodigal son, he's far away from his father. He is in a foreign land. He's wishing he could eat the, the food that was meant for the pigs. And he comes to uh, himself, and this is, I'm Quoting from Luke 15, 17, he says, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Now, what exactly was it that made the son's condition so miserable? It was not merely the fact that he was hungry. 
It was not merely the fact that he was engaged in feeding swine an animal that would have been repugnant to the Jewish people. That was bad, but that was not the thing that exacerbated his misery. The, the thing that exacerbated his misery was this. He was a son. He wasn't supposed to be there. The, the, his, his father, he was his father's son. So he, here's where the parallel exists. His sonship was not marred, vitiated, destroyed, effaced, erased by his distance. It was his, his sonship that actually made his distance all the worse. So now you may be beginning to see, okay, there's similar, similarities between p- what Pascal is doing and the image of God, right? Pascal is saying, I, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but our very craving for happiness reveals that there is happiness to be had and that happiness to be had makes us feel all the more miserable that we don't have it. So the fact that we are created in the image of God, it makes the condition that we're, all, that we're in all the worse. And yet we cannot say exegetically, biblically, from a biblical theological the, uh, perspective that the image of God is, is lessened or um, diminished in any human being whatsoever. Rather, we're careful to say that the expressions of these imageness of the image-bearing nature of human beings are, are perverted. Where do we see this? We see this in relationships, with our relationship with God. We see it in what God meant us to be. We, we see it in our behavior. In every way, we see that, that we are what we should be doing because of our being constituted for relationship with God and the rest of the creation we are failing to do. All right, it's five till two. Let me just... A recap where I am, what, we've, what we're talking about, we're talking about to this point is I've given you an overview of Blaise Pascal's approach to Christian persuasion in which he wants to make his readers understand that they are in such a, there's such a paradoxical tension that they crave for an explanation. The explanation can be found only in Christian anthropology. And then what I'm in the middle of right now is talking about the image of God because what we're going to do is we're going to see does does the teaching about the image of God, does it map, does it match with Pascal's anthropology? And therefore, does it constitute an even more compelling case for the Christian faith? So we're going to stop there. And uh, Ben, would you just uh, wrap things up here?